Okay, let's make a start. Hey, welcome, everyone. I'd like to um, welcome our guest speaker for this evening, um, Professor Gil Barbazat, Emeritus Professor Gil Barbazat, um, <coughs> who's going to talk on the asbestos saga. And I'm sorry we got um, moved, but there's apparently a welcome for scholarship students down there. That's why all the big wigs are down there and the students. That's why they got shifted. Uh, but anyway, we'll make the best we can. So, Gil, looking forward very much to your, to your talk. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, Terence. Before <coughs> I give this talk, just a quick reference to the talk that Richard gave us last year mm. about the experience on the battleship. You asked what was a couple in French, and I volunteered a piece of snot, which was the vernacular. <laughs> the real word is a toad. <laughs> what Shakespeare described as ugly and venomous. But anyhow, the vernacular is uh, what kids pull out their nose at school, and a uh, couple is really a toad. Anyhow, asbestos. When I told one of my gastroenterology friends yesterday that I was giving this talk on asbestos, he looked at me and said, well, what do you know about asbestos? And you could well ask, what does a non-respiratory non-oncology, non-industrial medicine, non-epidemiologist, why the interest in asbestos? Well, the interest started in 2016 at Tiger Daily Times. There were three, in June, three uh, articles in over a number of days that lauded the fact that asbestos was being banned imports were being banned in New Zealand from the 1st of October 2016 and <coughs> the editorial from the 27th of June first paragraph says this newspaper's investigation into the toxic legacy of asbestos has made for sobering reading and I thought, yes, it is sobering, because I started the traditional course in pathology in the old course 60 years ago this year. And we were taught then how terrible asbestos was. And as a junior member of staff, as a houseman and a registrar, we looked after patients who were dying with asbestosis and with mesothelioma. Our very good pathology museum in uh, the medical school had bottles with asbestosis, lungs, mesothelioma. We were expected to diagnose them as third year students. And why did it take 50 odd years before it was banned in New Zealand and I hope to summarize some of what I discovered in the library and the very rich source nowadays of the internet so <coughs> in this talk I plan to cover, cover the various types of asbestos the history of how it came to be where it is today its uses, the health hazards, hazards asbestos related diseases that I've already mentioned, how people attempted to deal with these risks, how there was a lot of denial, obfuscation and skullduggery by interest industry to say, nah, it can't be that bad, we're making a lot of money from this. And then how litigation started putting the screw on industry and finally where are we today well there are many different kinds of asbestos and they are all carcinogenic there were theories initially and uh, attempts and experiments to show that some were innocent but none is innocent the and the bold type, amosite brown and crocodilite blue 
are the particularly bad ones because they respect you, but they're all guilty. And the ones that were mined in the Northwest Cape in South Africa was particularly the crocodilite. It was really a, a bad type of asbestos. Asbestos has been around for a long, long, long time. They've carbon dated some asbestos. It's been there since 70, 50,000 years ago. We are cooking utensils found back 2500 BC that show that people use these minerals. There are records in the Egyptian uh, artifacts, Persians, Greeks, Romans, and apparently Shabalamani had the trick that when he had guests, he took the tablecloths and napkins that he used, threw it in the fire, and all the detritus that was on the tablecloth, the napkins would burn away, and he put out the tablecloth again for the next people, and that was really uh, uh, very impressive. Pliny the Elder noticed that slave miners died very young with lung disease, and whether it was asbestos or other mining conditions at this stage, we don't know. And uh, Marco Polo, on one of his trips, was sold asbestos as salamander wool. And it was uh, because it was salamander wool it resisted fire. Well, the industrial era seems to have been ushered in in Canada in the mid 19th century. A farmer found the stuff, and uh, by the end of the 1970s, he took this cotton, it looked like white cotton, uh, for analysis, and gave it to the landowner, a chap called Ward. <coughs> and Ward thought this was interesting stuff. And he took it to the professors at the University at Quebec. And you can't trust these academics, you know. They looked at it and said, ah, it's hopeless stuff. But he persisted and went on and sent the samples to Boston in the US. And they said, wow, this is useful stuff. And uh, they said, well, you know, it would be worthwhile investing in this. So, being a wise businessman, Ward bought a lot of land and expanded his farm. And then, he sold part of his farm in 1878, a part of the claim for $40,000, and you can just see the acceleration in the profit in the land that was mined. In ten years later, he sold part of that to a company for four times the price. And eight years after that, it just blossomed exponentially, and he made a huge profit. And the mining <coughs> and the industry to make products from this asbestos, although the mining was mostly in Canada, was the industry was settled in Britain and in the USA. International interest took over, and there were these huge pit mines. There were shops factories like the cotton mills but doing asbestos and you can imagine what the air must have been like in those days <coughs> and mines started developing all over the place USA, Italy, Russia, South Africa but the factories were mostly situated in the USA and the UK and some in continental Europe in Germany it was a miracle material, and those of us who were brought up many years ago, asbestos was used for everything. It was wonderful stuff. 
You used it in buildings, there are all the examples over there, fabrics, nets, motor gaskets, seating floors, brake linings. When war came along, for ships, for tanks, for that kind of thing, ideal material. It's padded, it doesn't burn, if you land up in trouble, it really is good stuff. And in 2011, more than 50% of houses in the UK still contain asbestos. So we think we've got rid of it, but it's built in. And when it's built into things like concrete, that's fine. I mean, not going to do anybody any harm there. But it's taking it down or having anything fragment, then uh, it's risky. And this is something that really I thought of at the time, but became all the more real reading about this when you look at those twin towers coming down in New York when those planes went into it on 9-11. There were thousands of tons of asbestos in that area and the firefighters, first aid people, the people living there walking coming out through with the covered in, in soot as we saw on TV, they really might well be in trouble. And the Christchurch earthquake. When were those buildings put up? At the time of the heyday of asbestos. So we're not innocent with that here in New Zealand. The industrial growth really expanded. And you can see here, I apologise for the uh, split of the roof, but 1948, look at the expansion in production. And these are the Canadian figures, but around this time, 58 or so, well, 68, the mesothelioma deaths started accumulating. And look at the mesothelioma deaths. There's a very big gap between when people are exposed until when people get the disease. And it's often 20, 30, 40, 50 years between the two. So that made a lot of the epidemiology really difficult to sort out. Well, the health hazards are very well known. What diseases are known to be related? Lung cancer, pleural thickening, malignant mesothelioma, asbestosis and pleurisy, then also mesothelioma not only oppressed, uh, affects the pleural lining but also the gut lining in the peritoneum. There are other cancers that may be linked <coughs> but not as clearly. The others, the known ones, are bad enough. Well, health evidence started coming pretty soon. A few red lines started flashing. <coughs> when did this evidence enter the known realm of best available science? You know what science is like. You know what people like now in talking about climate change. Science is something. Something else is something else. It's very difficult to have a hard uh, uh, theory that's proven for everything. So things were open for discussion at, uh, when this danger first was raised. There were isolated observations. Why did people say this was dangerous? Well, Dr. Montague Murray showed that there was a very high mortality among asbestos workers. In 1906, deaths were recorded with asbestos. In 1918, some insurance companies first declined to cover asbestos workers because in the factories they were not good risk. Sorry, we're not going to insure you. And in the early 1920s, the US Navy listed asbestos as a hazard and uh, forced people to wear respirators when they worked 
with his vessels. But that didn't take on all that much and wasn't universally applied. W.E. Cook, a Lancashire pathologist, made a significant finding as early as 1924. And the internet is just magnificent. I mean, the young women involved, there's a photograph from 1924. Did an autopsy on this young woman. She was a textile worker. Her name was Nelly Kershaw. And she was said to have asbestos poisoning. Uh, and unfortunately, she also had tuberculosis. So difficult to say what caused her death. But Cook concluded that the mineral particles in her lungs originated from asbestos and were, beyond reasonable doubt, the primary cause of the fibrosis of the lungs and therefore of death. So this was a definitive finding. Evidence started to accumulate. Dr. Grieve showed a lot of pathology in asbestos workers in Leeds. 1927, isolated case reports appeared here and there of asbestos and toxicity. 1927 to 29, medical inspector asked, are recent findings coincidental or definite health risk of the asbestos industry? And what really was confusing that some people developed the disease long after they left the employment. So, you know, was it really linked? It could be something that they caught later. So, the Brits really got the act together and as early as 1930 they had an official governmental inquiry and David Skegg quotes this quite often, the Merriweather Report, where they maintained and from the publication of the document said prolonged irrational exposure to asbestos dust at high concentrations produced definite occupational risk among asbestos workers as a class. So that was defined. And in typical British style they said well we've got to do something about it. They organized a conference between the employers and uh, the inspectors concerning methods of suppressing dust because uh, it was said that if you nailed the dust, you were in trouble. And uh, they put in extractor fans, etc., in a lot of the factories. But immediately there was argument. When you say a high concentration of dust in the Merry Merriweather report, what does high concentration mean? Is low concentration okay? And a prolonged period, what does prolonged period mean? How long do you have to be there? Six weeks, six months, six years to get it? So there was a lot of argument. And then at the time, and even now, <clears throat> there are other mining industrial diseases like silicosis which you get from any mine uh, there was tuberculosis that was common among that mining population and in that time in history <coughs> the effect of the rising incidence of cigarette smoking became uh, very relevant so uh, the industry said hang on, hang on, you're blaming asbestos quite reasonably that you need to sort out which one's really the, uh, the problem here. But as time went on, toxicity became more and more recognized. Fatalities report showed that the mortality was raised, but the report itself was labeled for internal use only. It did not reach public eyes. The Bureau of Mines in the US described, described dangerous dust. And in 1933, MetLife Insurance settled 
with 29% of claimants in one company who said they'd been affected with very strict conditions. They were given a payout provided that they signed a disclaimer that they would never ever gain any other compensation for their breathlessness. And if they got mesothelioma or died later, that was their problem. And then <coughs> two Americans, Lynch and Smith, this, uh, published in the American Journal of Cancer, 1935, an article on lung cancer related to asbestos. Well, industry didn't like all this adverse publicity. And how do we get all these details from 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago? A lot of it came out in the court cases that really started around about the 1970s and really exploded in the 1980s. I'll come back to that. But those court cases subpoenaed a lot of information that were held in secret by the companies and became public knowledge. And if you want to read horrific stuff, I mean, some of that is just absolutely awful. But uh, that's what happened. And some of the very big companies were guilty of doing a lot of the uh, um, subterfuge to hide what they were doing in the company. And some of them went bankrupt, but then they re-established themselves with another name. So it was very difficult to bury them. One of the insurance doctor, doctors said, you know, he's just getting too many claims and this is toxic stuff. And he was accused of outrageous misconduct. The uh, editor of this asbestos magazine was instructed to publish the positive things about asbestos and not to publish anything related to the toxicity. And then the industrial <coughs> research into uh, asbestos, research in inverted commas, just as is done now with a number of things where the tobacco industry, for instance, did the research to show that tobacco wasn't really as toxic as they thought it was. And, of course, this research was very closely controlled by the people who conducted it, and only the results that suited them were published. There were a number of things that really helped the asbestos industry tremendously. And the first was the Great Depression. <coughs> because if you were offered a job in an asbestos factory with its risk, or unemployment and poverty and hunger and perhaps death that way, you took the job. So it was really on the side of industry. And then, of course, in World War I and then World War II, the uh, asbestos industry just took off and was really a very lucrative industry. And <coughs> I've got the article there, if anyone wants to see it, the uh, leading article from The Lancet in uh, 1967 uh, came to the conclusion that yes, this was relatively dangerous stuff, but it would be ludicrous to outlaw this valuable and often irreplaceable material in all circumstances, as this can save more lives than it can possibly endanger. So this was from a responsible medical journal. Well, from the court cases we had learned that it was deliberate company policy in many of these cases to hide the toxicity of asbestos. References to toxicity was removed from all their so-called research publications. Warning labels were removed from products because you don't want your product to get a bad name, do you? And then 
a, a safety director in one of the uh, factories was brusque enough to suggest they wear masks. No, nah, nah, people get suspicious if they have to wear masks. That's nonsense. Then the cancer risks started to raise their heads above the parapet. As I mentioned, there was that Lynch and Smith case from the States. Then, during the war, there were some rural cancers. Probably they were getting closer to the gold in Germany. There were isolated reports of what was subsequently found to be mesothelioma in Canada. And then came the publication from Sir Richard, well now Sir Richard Dahl, uh, well the late Sir Richard Dahl in uh, Oxford. And he, in typical style, went into that as a real epidemiologist, so-called father of uh, epidemiological analysis. And he took 105 coroner's autopsies in employees from Rochdale textile plant over a period of time. And if they had asbestosis, 15 had lung cancer, lung cancer as a group. If they did not have asbestosis, in 30 patients, 3. And this was highly <coughs> statistically significant. And he also concluded from that article that if you were employed 20 years or greater, your chance of getting a lung cancer was 10 times that of the population not in his business employment. That paper had difficulty getting to the press. Sir Richard Dahl was approached by industry and said, so you can't publish this, this is dynamite. And he said, well, these are my findings. This is what I've got. I'm going to publish it. Then the editor of the British Journal of Industrial Medicine was approached by industry and said, you publish that. And we have a decline in our industry. We'll sue you. And he said, well, be my guest or something equivalent and uh, he published it. Then came Christopher Wagner. He was one of the people we learned a lot about as medical students in the 50s and 60s. He was an ex-war veteran, Second World War, came back and did his medicine in Johannesburg, University of Witwatersrand, and uh, had an interest in respiratory disease and he was seconded as an asbestos research fellow to the pneumoconiosis research unit which was linked to the asbestos mines in the northwestern Cape because they were having a lot of respiratory problems and as I mentioned they uh, produced that crocodilite stuff which was really very toxic and he published the paper in 1959. It's a real credit to our pathology teachers. We were students in 59, and they were up with the meeting stuff and taught us all about this at the International Pneumoconiosis Conference in Johannesburg that asbestos was linked to a tumor of the pleural cavity called mesothelioma. And uh, his classic publication, also in the British Journal of Industrial Medicine, uh, showed that this was indeed very significant. This is the log relative risk, and this is the duration of exposure in years, and you can see that it really uh, is tremendous uh, a link between the two. That's inexcusable. And mesothelioma was rarely seen away from asbestos. And now we know that those who were thought to be away from asbestos had contact with asbestos so many years ago that people's 
stop making the link because they got it 50 years later. Can't be linked. So uh, Wagner did a, a, a wonderful task in that. But as soon as that happened, he was going to present his results in Europe and uh, the mining industry said to him, you can't present that stuff, that's terrible. So he said, well, I'm going. And they said, all right, well, if you go, you present your paper and uh, that's it. And he said, well, I've got to answer questions. And they said, all right, you can answer questions. He went and the word got about that uh, his paper was taken very seriously and when he came back he got death threats. So he left and went to Wales where he joined the pneumoconiosis research unit that had been set up there. And he did some very good work with experimental animals showing that all types of asbestos were associated with pulmonary changes, mesothelium. And uh, that was the original paper, British Journal of Cancer, and uh, was well received. This was noted by no less than John F. Kennedy and his scientific advisors, and he said, hang on, this is important stuff. We'd better do something about that. But as you'll remember, J.F. Kennedy was assassinated. But the impetus went on, and the New York Academy of Sciences uh, held the conference that was first postulated and invited 40 delegates from eight countries, both scientists, industrialists, physicians, and the word is said that what they discovered and published in those 765 pages were enough to settle the whole question. One, it is toxic, it produces a huge mortality, that it is related to industry, that there's a long lag period, and this stuff is unsafe. Everything we know to date was published in that paper. Well, everything in inverted commas. And <coughs> a few things came up from that. In the States, the Env Environmental Protection Agency was set up. Uh, asbestos was the first substance to be regulated. And on testing, was found to be pot found in potable water in most places in the US, which is not really good news. They set up the Clean Air Act, the Toxic Substances Act, and I think you might be uh, encouraged to know that these are two of the acts that the current <coughs> government in the US has decreased the uh, strength of the regulations. So, uh, I'll come back to that again a little later. And this is where the combat between ideology and finance really became intense. But evidence of toxicity just got stronger and stronger. There were very few publications on this from US and Canada despite their, they being leaders in the use and most of the publications came from other countries. Scientists were very careful in what they said because they were vilified, they were sued, and uh, there was manipulation of investigation. There were counter-publications made showing that this stuff wasn't really toxic. The studies were redone and those that didn't suit industry were not published and those that did were, were published by industry. The UK <coughs> was very active and uh, it had to be licensed in 1983, partial ban in 85, 
product safety had to be uh, uh, really tight, then it was banned in the workplace in 87 and finally banned completely in 1999. In the USA, the EPA banned most asbestos products in 1989, but only two years later it was appealed in the appeal court and, to <coughs> uh, and is legal to the state in the US. It's then that the law got involved and this was a real night and day turnaround for the asbestos industry. There were personal injury claims, lawsuits proliferated, companies started going bankrupt and uh, there was mass tort and mass tort for those of us who don't have a legal background emerged when an event or series of related events allegedly injure a large number of people giving rise to a large number of cases and here there were a large number of cases Eight, 1980, 15,000 claims against 300 companies. By 1990s, 100,000. There's 750,000 cases on record. So it's just enormous. And these companies just couldn't take it. And <laughs> you'll note I have a little illustration on each of these slides. <clears throat> and I thought, how do I... Uh, put an illustration of obfuscation or misconduct by industry. So I put those words into Google and pressed images and the first two images came up with two books Outrageous Misconduct The Asbestos Industry on Trial. So it, it well known that they were really, really terrible. John's Manville set up in 1858, made billions and billions, went bankrupt in 1982, <coughs> but revived in 1988 under another name. Ray Bestos, bankrupt in 1989 after a lucrative long history, revived in 2000. So, as I indicated previously, lots of information has come up from the court records. And some, some of these scientists were really great, but it also shows the frailty of humanity. And all of us here just have to question ourselves, how frail are we? That chap, J.C. Wagner, who first described the mesothelioma, who himself received death threats, he did wonderful work. He, became known as a bon vivant, and he and his wife retired to Dorset in the UK and in the court cases it was shown that he had been bought by industry that he had a number of contracts the one brought him three hundred thousand dollars they were US dollars over 15 years there was another company who employed him to write papers for them provided he wrote exclusively for them and they never asked him to publish anything and for somebody who really was a good guy initially even to turn around and say toxicity was not dose related was not related to some of the forms of asbestos. These are things that he showed in mice in a publication previously. But you know, Wagner says therefore, people say, oh well it can't be that bad. Well, coming back to closer times, deaths continue. These are estimates of course. Papers latest 2018, 255,000 deaths per year. Still, over 2 million tons consumed annually and every 20 tons the epidemiologists work the magic statistics tell us 
will kill one person. Where is asbestos still produced? The biggest producer is Russia. China, Brazil, Kazakhstan, India. And for those of you who want a good investment, uh, Zimbabwe is wanting capital to redevelop the asbestos mines. Where is this being consumed? Well, China is a lot. Russia, the main producer, only 8%. For many, many years, Canada had banned it for its own use, but still exported it. Now Canada doesn't export anymore. But look at the third world countries. They are still absorbing the stuff, just like tobacco. And it's being marketed there, it's useful stuff, and that's where it's being used. Now I apologize for this graph, it's hopelessly complex. But just to point out a few things, these are just two methods of measuring mesothelioma. But it measures the mesothelioma deaths, and it was quite a late publication. The highest number in China, India, United States, UK. But all these other countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Netherlands, Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, they all on the list. But look at China and India, where it's still being used a lot. And bear in mind that the worst comes 20 to 50 years after peak use. So the end is not nigh. These are the UK projected figures. And here are the years, the deaths, and you can see the mesothelioma deaths. And it was banned in 1999, and they are projecting that it will come down again after that. But in countries that are expanding its use, that's just going to go up and up. What about New Zealand? This is what distressed me reading these articles in the ODT. We first started importing asbestos here in the 1930s, and they say most houses built between the 1930s and 1970s will have asbestos, most industry buildings up to the 1990s will have asbestos. New Zealand has hardly produced any. There was a small mine in Tartica at one stage, but uh, New Zealand fortunately is not a producer. Raw imports, in other words the fibre that could be made into products, was banned here in 1984, and all products were banned on 1st of October 2016. And as David Skegg points out in that paper, it's really a disgracefully long time. And already, round about the early 2000s, there'd been about five, 6,000 deaths attributed, and uh, they predicted, predict that uh, deaths will reach 12,000 and that we still have quite a few years to go before uh, these will start declining significantly. And <laughs> to complete the bad news, dear Mr. Trump is making his business great again. He is relaxing the asbestos controls. He has been quoted as saying that carcinogenic activity of asbestos is a mafia conspiracy. The US imports are up 2,000% in the last few years with Russia, the biggest exporter. And when I first saw this, I thought, nah, this is an internet scam. But I checked it on a number of sources, and they are pallets with Trump's photograph on it, with, in Russian, 
approved by the 45th President of the United States. Donald is on our side, it says. So they will continue to have a problem over many, many years. So the final irony, and this was leveled at the Canadian, thanks to the efforts of the federal government, we will continue to make a killing in more ways than one. This business is dangerous stuff, and I hope I've convinced you that we took far too long to do something about it. And there are other threats to our livelihood, to human livelihood, which we have to listen to science to do something about and not let greed and commercial obfuscation deviate us from the path we know we should take. Thank you. Questions? Not so much a question as a comment. I'm not sure what experience others have had in the local scene, but I remember some years ago as an anaesthetising patient when John Murray did thoracotomies for uh, malignancy, and there was more than one occasion we had guys who had mesotheliomas and the, this was the end result of them having snow fights in the hillside workshops many years ago with <laughs> asbestos, not realising, of course, this, this, would have, this would have been, my experience would have been maybe late 60s into the 70s, because it was certainly when the Wakari unit was operative, mm -hmm. so that moved to the Needham there in 80 or 81, yeah. so it was those, that decade. So how long before that they had been exposed I don't know, but obviously many years ago. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the railway workshops here. I think when you mentioned the case, and David Skegg has mentioned this case as well, of a woman who developed mesothelioma. She'd never been associated <coughs> with asbestos, but her <coughs> husband mm -hmm. worked in the railway workshops and she washed his overalls. And she's the one who copped it with the mesothelioma, so it's really... And we had a dreadful case uh, in Cape Town. I remember I was a medical registrar looking after this poor chap. Uh, a young man really wanted to do medicine, couldn't afford to go to university. The mines paid very good salaries, so he went to work in the northwestern Cape, built up a nest egg, came to do medicine. In his fourth year he got a mesothelioma. Not the death sentence. Yes. Do you know? Do you have any comments about how the Dunedin Hospital came to contain asbestos? Sort of was built about forty or fifty years ago. It, it was part of the normal building material. You put in your your request for goods, and they just contained asbestos. It was just mm -hmm. part of the standard delivery. Gil, this is sort of contentious. I mean, I'm very aware of asbestos-related deaths. One of my rheumatology colleagues died of uh, really? mesothelioma, really? presumably from his exposure with on building sites as a medical student. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the, the reason it was used so extensively was allegedly its fireproofness. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and which was... I think true, no. and you know, one is conscious of horrible deaths in buildings like that one in London recently, where the cladding <laughs> caught fire. Is there, you know, a hole left by the you know, by the banning of asbestos? Are we now using more dangerous building materials from a fire point of view? The answer is yes, and it, it is a problem. That's why it's such good stuff, and I think you missed that th at the beginning, that even the Lancet said it would be irres... There was a leader in the Lancet that said it would be irresponsible to ban asbestos because it will save more lives than possibly could be lost from its toxicity. But we have to avoid toxicity. When you look at those numbers now, I mean, it's, it, they just must use better combustible materials or non-combustible materials that are not asbestos. But is there such a thing? 
no idea. <laughs> I have one comment and one question. Uh, firstly, in defense of Canada, uh, Dr. Margot Becklake um, has done, spent her whole life working on the asbestos industry in Quebec and has published extensively, as has W. Casey Morgan, who was a, an internationally renowned respirologist from Britain who came to Canada and who also worked extensively on asbestos in Canada and published. So that's just one comment. Right. Um, my, my question has to do with your projected 12,000 deaths in New Zealand. Is that per year or over? No, total. 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 Do you have any idea what the breakdown is um, of those deaths between asbestosis, lung cancer and mesothelioma? I, this, the figures I quoted were from the ODT and as I remember they are about half half. Okay, because that's a very different ratio than you get when you're looking at asbestos workers who have worked in the industry over yep. years. Yep. Um, yep. Even taking out the latency that up to 50 yep. years for mesothelioma, you still get mesothelioma as a very small proportion and lung cancer as the biggest one yep. and asbestosis nowadays is a very small one. Right. Okay. And, and the other point that I didn't make specifically, <coughs> was that if you expose to asbestos and you're a smoker, oh, yeah, then your risk, risk goes up even, yes. even more. Yes, multiplicative. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's built into that equation. Yes, well. that is what comes into yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're on the topic of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> we're both from Canada. <laughs> I love Canada. So, I mean, the, the side, I mean, the, the, the town is called asbestos. Really? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, the town of Asbestos is where a very large open pit is and it's stunning, the stunning side. Uh, but coming back to your last point, uh, the reason it's called Asbestos is because the whole area depends upon, or depended upon that industry. Yeah. And you can't de-emphasize enough the political influence that has stopped any progress in this area because the politicians in Canada, both provincial and federal, have been very conscious of the impact of the shutdown of the one industry towns. Yeah. It happens in pulp mills, yeah. paper mills, and all the rest, but asbestos is a, an outstanding it's example point, yeah. where the political influence to avoid shutting, you know, panning asbestos completely over the past years, I've lived in Canada 50 yeah. years, yeah. over that period the political influence has been yeah. quite extreme yeah. Yeah. and, and <coughs> you know you pointed out the Trump business yeah. uh, this, and you're absolutely right but yeah. it, it is a major factor. Oh, it's huge and I don't envy the politicians there because people have gone through that with the coal industry, the coal mines, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really to see these coal mines going and you put people losing their jobs. That's awful, but that's reality. Yeah. yeah. There was somebody else that yes. uh, yeah. do, they, do they know what mechanism is involved in causing cancer? I can't answer that question. I just don't know. It, uh, uh, any. I didn't hear the question. Biochem the, the question is is there any mechanism? known by which the asbestos produces the cancer. The Cro one. chronic irritation was the one that... Yeah, Bruce one. The mesothelioma radiologically uh, is on the plural, the parietal pleura, rather than on the visceral pleura. It's on eventually ends on both. But one theory was that the asbestos fibers are long uh, needles, and so they always go to the base of the uh, lung field by, just by gravity. Then they stick through the pleura, and then they kind of scrape up and down on the parietal pleura, and the chronic irritation produces the plaque and the calcification, and ultimately the mesothelioma. That was at least one theory of it. I think that's still the prominent theory, okay. is it's a mechanical thing, because chrysidolite, which is the long, thin, needle-like yeah. one, has got much the highest risk of mesothelioma, yeah. and chrysotile, which is the spiral yeah. Yeah. one, has a relatively low yeah. risk yeah. of mesothelioma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, just in, I'll go back then. in terms of materials, <coughs> building materials that are fibrolites in the past might have contained it, but what do you know about other materials that are lurking around that contain this stuff? And a slightly sideways 
question and do the fi the, the, the little like fibers of fiberglass insulation have a comparable uh, effect on the mechanical effect? Of the <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, they they nasty things to work with with one's hands. Uh, which is supposed to be like one of these new miracle technologies that are coming out. Which you look at under a microscope, they're still very small, like fiber like things. Okay. So I don't yeah. know like, how concerned this thing that's going to run on those. Do you see that at all? It's 300 times the diameter of crystallite. Okay. So it's, it's supposed not to go as deep into the light. That's the theory. Yeah. I mean, when you work with fiberglass, it fits in your clothes. Mm -hmm. you, it's That's, right. Uh, That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
nice cooling breeze coming in through the window. I mean, lots of people were exposed that didn't know they were being exposed. One of my patients' husbands died of asbestos-related lung disease, and he was a teacher. And where he sat at his desk, there was a heater out there, <laughs> and the um, and it blew up there. And the uh, the there was a long metal track that brought it from the another building in the boiler room, and the caretaker put asbestos sheeting inside the uh, the duct to insulate it. Mm -hmm. So he sat there unbeknownst to him sucking up asbestos out of the heating fibre for a year after year. Yeah, you just don't know. I remember when you were saying when you were a kid in, in Zimb well, what is now Zimbabwe, a place called Shabani, I think it was, yeah. where they had asbestos mines, they used to put asbestos castings on the side of the street and when cars yeah. came past. <laughs> 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 what, what was that? The on the street? They, they put, they, all the roads were gravel in this mining village and they surfaced the roads with the tailings from the, the mine. And we <laughs> had relatives who worked there and had the this size, we weren't allowed to run around without shoes on because we might get asbestos fibers in our feet. But we were breathing the stuff when the cars were passed. Yeah. It was totally crazy. But you're still here. I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just counting the years. <laughs> 120. Um, I just want to ask what the difference between mesothelioma and other lung cancers are like. Um, yeah, clinical course and like survivability and all that kind of stuff. Well, mesothelioma is, uh, as Terry mentioned, of the lining of the pleural cavity. Some of them are the lining of the abdomen, and we saw some uh, presenting abdominally. And uh, they are a different kind of tumour altogether than the lung cancer, which is usually an adenocarcinoma coming from the bronchial tree. As I understand, it, you, you know more about that's that. True, that's true. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I work in the university's <laughs> MBA, and I lecture on strategy. And some years ago, it was my great disappointment that the director abandoned ethics and ethics input, which came in fact from the medical school because that's where you could teach ethics, and they came over and they taught ethics to the MBA. <laughs> that was abandoned. Um, my strategy lecture like, starts off by saying when you are planning the future development, long term development of a firm, and you're taking part in an exercise, get the senior people in the company together and walk past them and look into their eyes. And if you don't like what you see, clear out immediately. Mm -hmm. In other words, if they have no ethic in them, mm -hmm. there's no place for you. I teach that on my MBA. But otherwise, they get a clear uh, remit to go out and do what the hell they like. To make money. To make money. Yeah. To make money. And I'm now going to promise Gil a slot in my lectures to come and talk about asbestos mm -hmm. and relationship to industry <laughs> so that they get some idea of the reality rather than the fiction which is simply make money bastards. Could we go back to the pharmaceutical industry? <laughs> <laughs> Comments? I'd just like to ask a question about um, roof tiles of asbestos. How safe are they? Because they're exposed, but they're wearing over the years from the 1940s. They were very common. We live near one, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, so you work? The roof tiles. Made oh, roof tiles. Mm. Yeah. Again, most of them are okay as long as they're not disturbed. Mm. But if they should shed, if they should be the type that have wear and tear, you may be able to answer that better than I can. I think you exactly said it. You know, as they disintegrate and they yeah. fragment, it becomes a growing risk, and eventually they do need to be removed and removed carefully and thoroughly. Yeah. When there's a hurricane or an earthquake or something, mm -hmm. you become vulnerable. We got ours replaced when you could see the furry yeah. fibers <laughs> sticking out of the <laughs> concrete because it, it sort of goes powdery in the sunlight or something and I think yeah. the fibres start to stick out more obviously. Yeah. What a Gil, I'm sure everyone has... No. Do we have any idea 
of the population distribution of these figures. I worked at the Brompton in the 1980s, which was the mesothelioma centre of GB. And we had a huge incidence of it. All people in late middle life who had 20, 30 years mm -hmm. exposure at least. But uh, compared to the population working, in, let's say, within a certain circumference of that installation, do you have any idea of the ratio? Mm. I because don't. so many people didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. And oh yeah. the Brompton was yeah. particularly because it's strong in mm. pathology and radiology. Yeah. Yeah. And every case was examined in, in extraordinary detail. And of course we had the whole record <coughs> of the patient's first presentation. <coughs> but no, I don't think there was any epidemiology to uh, explain the, the relative Instance and therefore the relative risk mm. amongst the working population mm. of that factory. And that would be a go of mine, wouldn't, wouldn't it? it? Yeah. Mm. Well, the records yeah. are there. A good mm. PhD. The records somebody. are there, yeah. This is Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any more questions or comments? You've worked their whole lives. That's right. Phil, would you all join me, please, and thank you, Bill, for the wonderful. <laughs>